الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لا يهدينهم سبلنا سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم one of the central themes of the soul or purifying the soul is the idea called wukuf al-qalbi wukuf al-qalbi actually comes from the first word of this term actually comes from the verb waqafa yaqifu waqafa yaqifu wukufan fa huwa waqif and waqafa yaqifu means to stop or to halt or to stand still so that's the first term the second term al-qalbi means refer to the pertaining to the heart so wukuf al-qalbi means the halting of the heart or the stopping of the heart or the standing still of the heart and this is one of the central themes of the soul so what do we mean by the standing still of the heart or the stopping of the heart Basically what this concept implies or entails is that a person through his ibadah through his submission to the sunnah through his daily dhikr come to the state where his heart stops on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning his focus becomes Allah the focus of his heart becomes Allah his thinking his heart his desire his goals his dreams his aspirations his central focus in life it stops on Allah it becomes firm on Allah for the sake of Allah this is what we mean by wukuf al-qalbi now because this is kind of these terms are kind of theoretical people have a difficult time understanding it, but this actually exists in our daily lives in so many ways unfortunately not in the not on Allah but on other things for example if somebody in your family passes away or somebody that's very close to you passes passes away for three or four days straight you will not be able to think about anything else all you'll think about is that person that they passed away i can't believe that they're not here anymore i can't believe all the good times that we had we won't have those times anymore i remember when that person said this to me or when that person said that to me no matter what you do you're driving you're thinking about that you're talking to your friend you're still thinking about that in the back of your mind you're at school you're in class that thought is still lingering in the back of your mind that's called wukuf al-qalbi. Now, in that case, the heart has stopped or stood still on something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it exists in our daily lives. The same thing with this whole incident that occurred with the, with, in New York. People, when they heard this news, their hearts that became very focused on this. So they would be talking to people, but they would still be thinking about this. Most often, they'd be talking to people about this, but if they had to do anything else, if they were in class, if they were driving, if they were at home, they were constantly thinking about this event. Why? Because the heart had become stopped. The heart, the heart was standing still on this event. There were no distractions. Similarly, when there's a big exam, if you have a big exam tomorrow, no matter who you talk to, no matter where you go, no matter whether you're eating or you're about to sleep or you're doing something else, you're always remembering that exam. That's called wukuf al-qalbi. It means that your heart stops still on a particular concept. Now, of course, in tasawwuf, the goal is that your heart stops still on the focus of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the goal of every person who makes effort to develop their heart. That you get to the state where no matter what you do, no matter who you talk to, no matter where you go, no matter what time of day, your heart is always remembering Allah. It's always focused. You can't even change it if you wanted to. If somebody comes to you and talks to you about something else, you'll talk to them. But inside, you're still focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how deep your, connect, your connection is with Allah. And that's the goal for each person who aims to develop their heart. That they establish wukuf al-qalbi. Now, wukuf al-qalbi is kind of strange because it not only is it a state, but it's an exercise. So it's one of the strange things that actually has two faces. So not only is it a state, but it's an exercise. Meaning, you can't just wake up in the morning and say, I am now in wukuf al-qalbi. It's a state that you have to enter. But it comes through exercising that feeling. So by sitting down for a particular you know, part of the day, or by constantly returning your focus towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the day, you make yourself more likely to enter the state of wukuf al which is actually something that has nothing to do with effort, but it's just a natural state. So initially it takes effort, but then subsequently once you progress to a certain level, it becomes a common state. So initially you have to do your regular dhikr. Initially it takes extra fasting. Initially it takes regular prayers in the masjid. Initially it takes a submission to the sunnah. Once you do all these things, then the state becomes permanent, and then you begin to constantly, without much effort, be able to enjoy it. And the result is, is that no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter who you speak to, you'll always be focused on Allah. Your prayers become deep. Your actions become deep. Everything that has everything that has meaning in your life becomes deeper. That's one of the benefits. The second benefit is that once you've achieved the state of wukuf al-qalbi, then you actually have a new criterion by which you can judge all of your deeds. So if you have wukuf al-qalbi, you've now established wukuf al-qalbi in your life, and you know that you're constantly focused on Allah, and you go and you do some sin, you fight with your parents, okay, or you go and eat some, you know, you eat something what you may not, you may not, you probably should not have eaten or you see something you probably should not have seen, or you hear something that you should not have heard, and you feel a decrease in your wukuf al-qalbi, that's how you'll know that that act, how, that act is now detrimental to your spirituality. You can't tell if an act is detrimental to your spirituality until you actually have spirituality. Once you achieve, once you achieve a little bit of it, then every act that you do has a new criterion by which you can judge it. This is what the Prophet ﷺ meant when he said, ask your heart when you're deciding to do certain deeds. Right? There's a very famous hadith that if your heart says it's okay, then go ahead and do it. If you feel comfortable with it, then go ahead and do it. And what this means is that now that you've been given this state of Islam, now that you've been given a connection with Allah, if your heart feels comfortable doing some act, then you should go ahead and do it. Meaning, if, because meaning you don't feel a detriment in your connection to Allah. And in fact, this is how some of the ulama define taqwa. How do you define taqwa? Taqwa is defined as leaving every single deed which causes even the slightest de- de- decrease in your connection with Allah. Meaning, it implies that you had a connection with Allah previously, and then every deed that you do that decreases that connection with Allah, leaving that deed is called taqwa. 
So this is the goal of each of us, is that, number one, we establish this. And how do you establish it? It's very simple. Just by doing whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, coming to the Masjid for prayer. It's such a huge deal to come to the Masjid for prayer. That's something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did for every single prayer. Similarly, reading Quran on a regular basis, meeting with Muslims, helping Muslims, doing all the good deeds that a Muslim normally does, and then leaving the sins that cause a Muslim to backtrack in his path. When you do these simple things, then, inshallah, over time, these states begin to develop. They're just natural. You don't even need to aim for them. And then they become a criterion by which you can then judge all of your further deeds. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq, establish wukuf al-qadim in our lives, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a 24-hour basis, and to constantly turn our heart and our focus back towards Allah, such that it becomes a permanent state within us. One of the most important concepts in the profession of a Muslim in their deen is Suhaba. It comes from three basic letters, Sa'ad, Ha, and Ba. And these three basic letters, if you understand them and you understand the true meaning behind them, they provide a huge impetus towards improving and keeping yourself firm in your deen. Suhaba actually means companionship, to keep companionship with someone. And the best example of this is actually the Sahaba, because the Sahaba are named from the exact three same letters, Sa'ad, Ha, and Ba, Sahaba. So they actually exemplify the characteristics of Sahaba to the maximum degree. And in fact, if you want to look at the Sahaba and you want to define them, you don't define them, you know, we don't call them the Mufassirin, although among them were the greatest of the Mufassirs. We don't call them the Muhibbithin, although many of them preserved the Hadith. We don't call them the Fuqaha, although many of them preserved the Fiqh of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't call them the Mutasawifin. We don't branch them off according to any of the branches of the Sahaba, but we call them the Sahaba. And the reason we call them the Sahaba is because the ultimate thing which defined them was their Sahaba with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The thing that made them, the thing that gave them their status was the fact that they spent time in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the central principle that defines the Sahaba. In fact, if somebody accepted Islam and saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and never even prayed a prayer, never even fasted, never went to the Hajj, never paid zakah, but then died in a battle after that or passed away without having the opportunity to do any ibadah, he still falls in the category of a Sahaba. And that's because simply the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam provided such an extreme benefit to these people that this then became their, their mark for the people for the, for the rest of the, for the rest of time. In fact, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says about them, Allah Anhum Wa Radu'an, that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. So this is the central thing that defines uh, the characteristic of the greatest generation of Muslims that ever lived, meaning their companionship. And it's exactly this principle that all the subsequent generations after them held on to. Meaning, if you take the companionship of people who are righteous, and you take the companionship of people who have progressed in the deen further than you, then you will eventually be able to take, to inherit their characteristics. So this is exactly how we define the Sahaba, and not only among the Sahaba, and you can say, well, that's not a fair comparison because the Sahaba, the Sahaba, the Prophet was a Prophet. But the same thing with the Tabari. What's a Tabari? A Tabari is someone who saw a Sahaba in a state of Iman. Once they see a Sahaba in the state of Iman, they become a Tabari. And a Tabari obviously has a very high status in this deen because the Prophet Sallallahu said that Khayrukum, the best of you is the best of my generation. That the people of my generation, then the people after them, and then the people after them. So this is the definition of a Tabari. A Tabari is a person who came after the Sahaba, saw the Sahaba, spent time with one of the Sahaba. Similarly with the Tabari Tabari, how do you define the Tabari Tabari? The Tabari Tabari are defined as that generation of people that came after the Tabari who spent time in the company of the Tabari. So in each individual scenario, the way you're defining these people, the greatest generations in the history of Islam, is by the companionship that they kept. So this shows you and highlights the, the importance of companionship. Who you keep as your company will define what you become. Anybody, you can take anybody and you put them with smokers, put them with, in one, in one, for one month with a group of smokers, and they'll start smoking. Because that's their companionship. They take from the effect of their companionship. And you can take an average person, and you put them in the company of the greatest people, and they'll become among the greatest people. <clears throat> that's why you see people who, quote unquote, are, you know, for example, if you go to the Madaris in Pakistan, there's quote unquote people who failed out of school, who are called illiterate, who have no quote unquote abilities, and they enter into a madrasa and they turn out to be some of the best ulama. They're reading classic Arabic texts, they're reading the Quran and translating, they're reading the most complicated tafasir, and people call them illiterate and people say they have no abilities. And you take, you know, a college student who's got 130 IQ and he's entering into the greatest universities in America, and he's Muslim and he has a desire to learn Arabic, and he can't do it. He, can't, he can't do it even with all that ability. Because everything's based on your companionship. When you keep the right companionship, that's when you will progress in your deen. And that's exactly what the Sahaba were. They were. The Sahaba are essentially defined as the people who kept the companionship of the Prophet. Now obviously the Prophet was the greatest of companions, and then the Sahaba subsequently emulated him. So that's exactly the goal for each of us, that we should look at who our companions are, who do we spend time with, who do we hang around with, because those are the people that will end up becoming like in the end. So we should search, I think, for the most, you can look for the people who are the most righteous in your community, and you purposely go and spend time with those people. And you hang around those people, and you make those people your companions, and you make those people your group, because ultimately that's how you'll progress, and that's how you'll attain something in this being. So that should be the goal of each of us. Now, if you look at many of our lives today, we have many companions that unfortunately hold us back in our deen. And the first and the foremost is the TV. Every time you turn the TV on, every time you allow those companions to enter into your life, they draw you down. There's no doubt about it. Because they put ideas into your head, they put a lifestyle in your head, they put images into your head, they put sounds into your head that become something that tugs at your, at your fundamental being. 
So every time you have companionship with these people, it, it has an effect on you. You may not realize it, but companionship has an extreme effect. And I've just given you all these examples. Similarly, the, what we listen to, what we eat, who we spend our time with, all these we have to search and, and really, really think deeply about each of the companions we keep because each of those in the end will have an effect on, on us. And at the same time, we should also look for good companions. And the ulama have written a very, very detailed list of how you seek out your companionship. And obviously, number one is you look for people who follow the Sharia, people who put importance on the Sharia, people who put importance on the Sunnah, both internal and external, people who regularly have the Tawfiq to read the Quran, people who regularly come to the Masjid, people who regularly spend their wealth in charity, people who, all the things that are good that are listed in the Quran and the Hadith, those are exactly the kind of people that you want to hang around with. And eventually, you'll become like them. And this is, this is exactly what we have, we have this chain that exists within the deen. So, you know, somebody finds, somebody spends time with their teacher and then they, other people spend time with them, other people spend time with them, and eventually, the entire community rectifies itself. And you'll see this over and over again. I mean, there'll be people who you'll see in my colleges, they'll change their lives. It's like some sister will put on hijab, or some brother will start spending more time in the masjid, or some person will start spending more time reading the Quran. And you'll see their whole family initially had nothing to do with Islam. And then slowly over time, because of that one person, the whole family begins to change. That's because of the companionship of that person. People, the people in the family don't even know it. They don't even have a choice. They don't actively say we're going to change our lives. But because that person changed their lives, and then they go and they take the company of their family, their family eventually changes. It's, it's, it doesn't even need to be through words. It has nothing to do with words. The, the Prophet was silent more than he spoke. It's, it has to do with sitting with those kind of people. You can almost upon a whole Allah showers his blessings on those kind of people, and then when you sit with them, you ultimately benefit. So this is one of the most important concepts within this deen, and people unfortunately don't realize it. It has nothing to do with books. It has nothing to do with lectures. It has nothing to do with, you know, billboards and conferences. It has to do with simply finding people who are righteous, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the tawfiq to develop their deen, and then spending time with them. And that's how you improve. That's how you improve over a sustained period of time. And that's exactly, you know, our own goal as well. Why do we meet every morning? Why do we spend time on keeping company with one another? Because when I keep company with you, I benefit. When he keeps company with us, we all benefit. When you keep company with us, everybody benefits. Similarly, spending time in the masjid. When you spend time with the people whom Allah has given the tawfiq to enter the masjid, you benefit. Because nobody can enter the masjid except Allah gives them the tawfiq to do it. There are so many people. I mean, how many people say five or ten, fifteen people in the masjid? And how many people live in the vicinity? Two or three thousand. You know, people, I've heard two or three thousand families live in the vicinity of this masjid. And many of them, you know, they don't even, it doesn't even come in their mind that they should come into the masjid. In fact, for many of us, it didn't come in our mind until recently. And it's just to tell people Allah. It's just up to Allah. It's nothing to do with what, we, with what we've done. We didn't earn coming into the masjid. We didn't inherit it from our parents. You have to have the tawfiq, and it has to be that Allah blessed you with the idea to come into this masjid and to spend time here. And people, that, and many people know. You ask anybody, how many times is the reward for playing, playing in the masjid? I'll tell you, it's 27 times more. Yet how many people will have the actual ability to get up in the morning, start their car, drive it over here, come into the masjid, and then play the pleasure of in the masjid? Yet the rewards are so great that the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who prays Fajr in the Masjid, he gets the rewards if he prayed half the night. Half the night of prayer on the Day of Judgment. Imagine the value of that. I can tell you right now that even one ayah in prayer is more valuable than anything that we'll ever earn in this life. Or that, I mean, anything that you can ever earn in this life. One ayah in the Masjid is more valuable than all the salary that you will earn in your entire life. From when you start working to when you end. Add it all up. It can be a billion dollars. Your one salah in the Masjid is worth more than that. Because that is the essence of what we were sent here for. And that was the piece of the upon us. These are the, this is the model of the Prophet them. So, this is the goal for each of us, that we establish the sunnah and the sharia in our lives. And the way you do it is through company of those people whom Allah has granted to to do so. Meaning you spend time with the hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has developed and then subsequently you'll benefit. And this has been the tradition, this has been our tradition all the way from the time of the Prophet. The Sahaba, they start the company of the Prophet. The Tabaeen, they start the company of the Sahaba. The Tabaeen, they start the, the, the company of the Tabaeen. And then after that, all of the righteous people of this ummah have always sought the company of the Mashaykh and the ulama, spent time with them, learned from them, and subsequently developed themselves so that the next generations could benefit after them. This is, this deen is transmitted by interaction with one another. All the books in the world can be burned and the deen will continue. Yet, if you remove the mashayah and the ulama from the world and you have all the, all the deen in the books, nothing will exist. And it's exactly why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't send a book along that sends a prophet with it. Because it's exemplified. The deen is exemplified and the deen is learned from person to person to person. That's the means of transmission of this deen. So, place an extreme amount of emphasis on who your company is. Find those people who are the most righteous within your community and spend time with them. Spend time in the masjid because that's the greatest place to spend company. And eliminate the company of those people and those things that will bring you down. Especially nowadays, it's less people and it's more mechanical things like the TV and the radio and the internet. And we end up reading things or seeing things or hearing things that should not be part of our company. That was kind of what I'll give us a topic to establish this simple principle in our life and give us a topic to find the company of those people who, inshallah, he has pressed and guided on the straight path. Allah 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 سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم The life of a Muslim is extremely unique. The second that a Muslim is born, or in some instances the second that a Muslim attains the aid of responsibility, or the moment that somebody accepts this deen and takes the shahada لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم they automatically enter the state of a servant of Allah سبحانه وتعالى one moment, somebody can be completely free, able to do whatever they want, able to go where they want to go, able to eat what they want to eat, able to schedule their time the way they want to schedule their time, and the next moment, by taking one simple statement, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, they now become a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And each one of us are servants. Otherwise, why would we be here? 
Each of us has work that we could be doing in our offices. We have places that we could be. We have other things that we could schedule. The only reason that we come here is because Allah commanded us to be here and because we are his servants. When he makes a command, we are responsible to fulfill that command that is upon us. That's the only reason for coming here. And if you're here for any other reason, then know that the greatest reason and the greatest of the niyah is that you come to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the beauty of this deen. That as servants, we no longer have a choice in any matter. We wake up in the morning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah tells us to wake up for the Fajr Salah, we wake up in the morning and we pray, we make wudu, we wash our hands, we wash our faces, we wash our feet, and we pray the prayer, we wake up and talk to pray the prayer because we are servants of Allah and because we don't have any other choice. Similarly, all of the deeds of the Muslim in his day, they're all centered around Allah. Everything that we do is a service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as servants, this also places us in a very unique position because we no longer have, we lose our ability to have an opinion or to have choices in certain matters. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what to eat and what not to eat. And therefore, we are servants. We have no other choice. We can't eat the meat of a pig because Allah told us we can't eat it. There's no other reason. We can give all the different rational reasons for why you, should eat, why you shouldn't eat pork. Oh, there's certain diseases associated with pork. Oh, there are certain bad, you know, uh, there's a high cholesterol associated with pork. But the point remains that even if pork was proved to be the best meat in the world, nobody can eat it because as servants of Allah, we were taught that we cannot eat this meat. Similarly, we don't drink alcohol because we're servants of Allah. We're restricted in what we can drink. We're restricted in what we can eat. We're restricted in when we can sleep. We're restricted in where we can go. Even we are restricted in what we can look at. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us what to look at and what not to look at. We are not supposed to look at the, the, uh, somebody that's not your maham, to look at the, to look at the uh, physical features of the opposite sex, both for men and women. We are not allowed to do that because we are servants of Allah. He has given us this eyesight and now he has commanded us exactly how to use it. Every single breath that we take, there is an aspect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is an aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servitude in that breath. The beauty of this is that we live between the fear and the hope and the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at every given moment in our life, these different aspects of this service, they come out. So we may wake up in the morning one morning because we're afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just read about the punishment that he gives to those people who disobey him. To the great hellfire that he has created for those people who refuse to subjugate themselves to his laws. To the, the painful punishment in the grave for those people who decide on their own and don't ask from the Prophet on them or from Allah. So that's an aspect of fear. Similarly, there's an aspect of hope. We may wake up one morning to perform the service that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon us because of the fact that we have hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this enormous jannah. That even one moment in that Jannah is more than anything that you can attain in this world if you live from the beginning to its end. The Jannah is so vast and so diverse that perhaps some days this aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places us further in its flavor. On other days we wake up and we see the sun rising and we see the skies and we look at the trees and we look at all the creation around us and we're in awe. That what a supreme creator, how amazing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, that he created each of these individual things that if all the universe came together and tried to create a fly, they wouldn't be able to do it. And how many hundreds of thousands of people in the history of time have tried to study the aspect different dimensions of the human body? How many billions of dollars are spent and how many millions of people have devoted their lifetime to studying the human body? A one single creation of Allah, and yet we know only one to two percent of what is truly the science behind the human body. Right? They say that knowledge is not the the knowledge of the world is of what we have and why exists is probably less than one percent. To this day we're continuing to discover new and unique things about the human body. A single aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So this might be one aspect that first forces us into slavery of Allah. That we know that this creator who created the entire universe, everything that it contains, and for the whole world to gather together to create even an atom, it would not be able to do so. That may be an aspect that forces us further into slavery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another day we may wake up and we may be shocked to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us enormous blessings. The fact that we eat food one time a day, let alone three times a day. The fact that we have air to breathe. The fact that our eyes work when we wake up in the morning. The fact that we're not sick, that we're healthy. All these things may force us into slavery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the point remains that no matter what you look at, no matter how you think, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you are always a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no choice in the matter. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribes to us in the Quran, we subjugate ourselves to it and we bow to it. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to stay away from is exactly the same scenario. We stay away from those things because we have no choice in the matter. This is the ultimate of our deen. It's that simple. If you want to summarize the deed, if you want to summarize the life of the Prophet Sunnah, it is that he was the, the most submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what his sunnah is. That's the definition of the sunnah. The sunnah is a description, a written description, a verbal description of what the most subservient of all of creation, how he reacted to different situations in his daily life. That was the Prophet Sunnah, the greatest of servants, the most true to Allah, the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we study the sunnah. When we see that the Prophet Sunnah wake up and read the particular dua, we know that he read it in complete consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding his life as a servant of Allah and fulfilling every aspect of it. When we see that the Prophet Sallallahu preferred to wear a certain color, when we see that he preferred to walk a certain way, when we see that he preferred to stand at certain times and sit at others, these are all signs of the most perfect servant of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the one who has earned the highest maqam in this world and who will inshallah have the highest maqam in hereafter. That's why we study his life. That is exactly why we study the sunnah. It's not an academic exercise. It's not a history. It's not a story that we read to our children and say, MashaAllah, look at these people and how they live. It is an uh, example. That if you want to be a true servant of Allah, if the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grasps you, if the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grasps you, if hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grasps you, then know that the most perfect of all servants was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that if you want to be the most perfect of servants, you must emulate him in every footstep that he took. This is exactly the lives of the Baba. Read the hadith. 
every single task that the Prophet did. They emulated it. They looked for it. They searched for it. They knocked on the door of the wives of the Prophet and they asked, tell us what did the Prophet eat so we can eat like that. Tell us how he ate so we can eat like that. Tell us what he did at this particular instance and what he did at that particular instance so that we can do exactly that. Why? Because he's the most perfect servant. We don't worship him, but we know that he was given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to subjugate himself to Allah in the most perfect way and subsequently we walk in his footsteps. That's the definition of the sunnah. And that should be the model and guide towards our life. In every single instance, in every single challenge that faces this ummah, in every single time of confusion, know that the Prophet is the model that you have to return to. And if you don't find it in his life, then you'll find it in the lives of his companions. And if you don't find it in the lives of the companions, you'll find it in the lives of the Tabaeen, or the Tabaeen, or the ulama who came after them, who explicated their deen for us until the end of time. And they almost upon what almost reserve all the explications that we have been transmitted. This is the understanding of this ummah. Whenever there is time of confusion, and especially nowadays where there's so much confusion, you have to look back to the Quran, to the Sunnah, and to the ulama of this ummah and understand how they commented on these particular instances. There's no need to go into details. There's no need to sit and talk about particular events because these are general rules. They apply at all times and all places. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter when you live, and no matter what you do for a living, you are subject to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those people that don't subjugate themselves to it, you can read their stories in the Quran. Those are not stories. The ummah that was destroyed before us. This ummah was destroyed for a particular reason. That ummah was destroyed for a particular reason. Are those stories fairy tales that we read to our children so that they can be entertained? No. They are signs of the incredible power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They get somebody that obeys him and we can refuse this to be in his service, then what can he do to a particular group of people? That's exactly what we find in the Quran over and over and over again. Nowadays people have begun to think that they have power equivalent to Allah, that they can hear anything that they want to hear, that they can see anything that they want to see, that they can do anything that they want to do, that they have all the power in the world and they can make any decision that they want. But the point remains is that Allah is in control. Allah is the only person who can see all, who can hear all, who can do all, who is complete in his justice, who is infinite in his grace. No one can challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let the people who decide to challenge him know that they can never succeed because we have a book full of the history of those people who tried to rise to that level. We have to remember in every first step that we take that we are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't make a decision except that he tells us to do it. We don't look at something except that he was benefiting it for us. When we don't look at something and put our eyes down, it's because Allah told us not to look at it. And when we look at something and put our eyes towards it, it's because the Prophet and enjoyed to look at that or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to look at such things. This is the life of a mu'min. This is the life of the people who subjugate themselves to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq in these difficult times to understand what it means to be a servant of Allah, to subjugate our lives to all the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to emulate our lives according to the greatest model of service, namely that of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhir da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa. Wa salamun ala ibadihi alladhi nasrafa. Amma ba'ud. Fa'udu lillahi min shaytani wa jini. Bismillahi wa rahmanu wa rahim. Wa al-lamina jahadu fina. Lanahdi annahum suhuluna. Subhana rabbika rabbil al-jati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-muslimin. Wa alhamdulillahi wa kafa. We talked about in the past that every path and every journey has its mark posts or sign posts. Meaning if you're pursuing a degree in engineering, you know that you need to take course 101 and then course 102 and then course 103 and then course 201 and then course 202 and then course 301 and 302. And then you need to take, you know, some specific engineering exam and then you receive your degree in engineering. So every single, and you'll find this throughout life, every single thing that you want to achieve has its signposts. So similarly with the signs of the Salwa, and we've talked about these a lot in the past, is there are so many signposts on the way for the person who attains nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the entering of the Sharia in one's life, the, the ability to submit to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa developing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, developing a connection with Allah, death of prayer, time spent reading the Quran, amount of days spent fasting, company that you keep, etc. The list can go on and on and on, and we've talked about some of these things in the past. But Along the idea of signposts, or things which show you where you are, are something called maqamat. Maqamat means your state. Another way to translate this is your state. And the ulama of the sallallahu the mustawwifin, when they experienced these states, they made notations of their experiences. So they wrote down, or in the, and more often than not, they translated to their students ideas and names for different states that they experienced as they submitted themselves to the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Sharia over a period of a lifetime. And that's what I call maqamat, what people say, you know, may Allah raise your maqam, or may Allah grant you a high maqam. And this is one of the meanings of the word maqam. One of the maqamat that is discussed among the Musasawifin is called maqam al-mushahida. Maqam al-mushahida. Maqam al-mushahida, what this means is, is that you attain a certain state in your life where you now have the ability to witness directly the results of your actions. So what do we mean by that? What we mean is that you attain such a degree of purity that you attain a certain degree of simplicity within your life, that you're able to directly relate, directly relate act to B with, with result B, for example. If you attain a certain degree of purity in your life, <coughs> and you attain a certain degree of submission, and you attain a certain degree of simplicity, you may be able to get to the state where if you eat something wrong, you see a direct result in your actions. 
for if you see something wrong, you see a direct result in your action, for example. Somebody is relatively is doing well, has been progressing on the path, and all of a sudden they look at something that they should not look at. And then the very next day, they don't wake up for budget. Or the very next day, they wake up late for budget. Or the very next day, they don't wake up for budget. In that case, they know, because they've attained such a degree of simplicity in their life, they know that act A, looking at that particular thing, resulted in a direct result that they can attribute. They can connect the connection to positive effect in their own life. Now, this state requires certain, a certain basis. And the first is, is that your life be simple enough that you can relate certain actions. Now, if you're, have, if you have, you know, five things that you do wrong every day, you don't, and you lose some, some established thing within your life, like you don't wake up for budget the next day, you don't know which of the five things you did. You don't know if it was, am I looking at this particular person that resulted in my not waking up for budget? Was it my, uh, swearing at somebody that resulted in my not waking up for budget? Was it my telling my mom that I don't care what she thinks that resulted in my not waking up for budget? You have no idea. You can't connect anything with that result because you have, your life is too complicated. Meaning your sins are too, your errors and your sins are too many. So the first thing that it requires is a certain degree of simplicity. The second thing it requires is that you have an established schedule. I mean, if someone never wakes up for pleasure, except rarely, sometimes reads the Quran and never touches it, and it's, it's very, very, you know, volatile in their daily Islamic the schedule, then they won't be able to detect any change. So there's two things that it requires. One is simplicity within your life, and two is that you have some sort of established schedule beforehand so that you can then attribute changes to your, to your daily, uh, to, as a result of your daily actions. So those are the two important things. And this is why there's such an emphasis on, one, avoiding every single sin, no matter what it, uh, what it is, and two, establishing a schedule. So the first and foremost thing, if you want to succeed in achieving any other Muqam in Sabu, or basically another way of saying it is, if you want to achieve, actually progress towards the end of Sabu, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, is that you have a schedule. We're not random people, we're not animals, and when we feel like doing something, we want to do this, and when we feel like doing something, we want to do that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very, very mindful at the time, was very, very mindful of the, of the acts that he would establish on a regular basis, to the extent that, if he did a single act on one given day, he would then continue to perpetuate that act till the end of time, till, at least till his end of time in this world. For example, one time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not able to pray the, uh, I think it's the four sunnahs of Asr. We're not able to pray those four sunnahs before the Asr prayer. It might have been that, or it might have been that he was not able to pray the four sunnahs after the prayer. Um, because whatever it was, it was one of these two prayers, and unfortunately it's my mind. But whatever the scenario was, it occurred because he had invited guests over to, uh, to, or guests had come to visit him, actually. And because he was not able to complete those, those extra supervisory uh, abbas, he then subsequently made them up after Asr one day. So that same day, he, after the Asr prayer, the follow of the Asr prayer, he made up whatever, whichever of those Raka he, he missed. After that, he used to do it every day. He used to regularly make up those Raka every single day. And Aisha Allah Anha asked him why he did that. She meaning, should she do that as well? And he said, no, you shouldn't do that. This is because once a prophet starts something, he must always continue it. So there was this idea, and you read this throughout, that once you're able to do something, once you've proven your ability to do something in the eyes of Allah, then you have to, you should try to continue to do it. So this is why when you establish your schedule, you should establish it slowly and establish it in a way that you can keep it perpetual. And then we've all heard the Habbul Amani, in Allah, Ibn Muha, wa Insanna, that the most beloved of all deeds in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that are Ibn Muha, those that are permanent, that are established, that are regular. Wa Insanna, and even if they're small, even if they're small, they are the most beloved in the eyes of Allah. So if this is not about once a week getting excited and then setting your alarm for tahajjud and then forgetting about it for the rest of the, of the month. This is about a planned and carefully thought out way of improving your schedule and developing your daily life so that it falls in line with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is the ultimate goal, that we develop a schedule and we do it over time. Now, I mean, you'll find multiple books and multiple talk and multiple uh, hadith, etc., which deal with different aspects of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he read when he woke up, what he read when he went to sleep, what he read uh, at all the different moments of the day. And these are all things that we should establish within our daily lives. And then you'll find other hadith and other uh, ulama speaking about how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set up his daily life, what were the acts that he, you know, put importance on, what were the acts that he shunned, etc. And all those things should slowly enter our life anyway, uh, should also enter our life. Now, <clears throat> once you've done that, or once you begin to establish that, then you, have, then you are on your way to achieving this, this idea of Maqal and Mushahidah. Because once you've established a schedule, and you've also worked towards eliminating some of the major sins from your life, then you can begin to understand this concept. There's two things that are really, really important about this, and when you reach this, you want, it becomes much clearer. But the first is that you'll read a lot of different instances of the Sahaba, and the companions of the Prophet and the Tadarin, and the Tadarin, and the Rekha Shaykh of this Ummah, of this, uh, um, giving you the hints that they have reached this state. For example, we've all heard the famous narration of a, one of the uh, people of our Ummah, who was memorizing the Quran, and they say that one day they were walking in the street, and they merely saw the heel, or the shin, of a woman who was not their mahram, and they couldn't memorize the Quran for 40 days, and they had forgotten what they had memorized. So you read a lot of uh, stories about this, that one particular Sahaba, he misses uh, his uh, prayer, and he looks back in his life, and he examines, and he finds that he did a particular thing. Or it's not necessarily a prayer, but a supernatural prayer. So you'll find this throughout. You'll find so many stories of Rashaya saying, I did this, and for 40 days I was not able to wake up with the Hajjah. Or I did this particular act, and I lost the ability to wake up with the Hajjah three days in a row. So these are actually really, or really like their actions with a result in their life. That's the first thing. So this helps us to understand some of the different narrations that we have about ourselves. The second thing that's important about this is that 
it really alleviates a huge amount of confusion that exists, especially in sort of nitpicking that stuff. So a lot of times, even if you look at the Sahaba, they didn't ask very many questions about their, da- their daily, you know, what they should be doing, what they should not be doing. They were just very sort of natural people. They came in the presence of the Prophet and they established themselves, they established a connection with Allah, and they sort of went on living with their lives, developing this connection, and where there was a deficiency or a defect, then they would go and approach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't ask very many questions, they didn't get very academic about, I mean, they did get academic, they didn't get intellectual about the deen. I mean, they didn't ask questions that meant nothing. They didn't ask questions just for the fun of it. They didn't ask questions just to play mind games. They asked questions that they had sincere need to know. For example, you know, one of those Sahaba comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and says, Ya I did such and such, and it resulted, you know, and I'm feeling distant, distant from my Lord, or I'm feeling bad about this particular thing, how do I make up for it? Or what kind of stuff do I need to make? Do I need to get charity? Do I not need to get charity, etc.? So they ask questions that directly related to their experience, to their experience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, once you get to this point, then many of the issues that we sort of get nitpicky on don't no longer become issues because your heart becomes, your heart and your life become a true uh, representation of where you're at. So if you are regularly waking up for a and you're regularly, you've established many of these women and the sharia within your life, and then all of a sudden you do something that has that results in you missing tajid for two or three days, and then you eliminate that act, and your tajid returns, then you have a very, very good idea of whether you should have been doing that act in the first place or not. You don't necessarily need to go and get a fatwa. Now, obviously, these have to be acts within Islam, and your experiential can never outweigh the, outweigh the sharia. But, on a sort of daily basis, and for some of the petty questions that we, all, that we often get involved in, except this then becomes a, a very practical way of judging our daily acts and judging where we stand in the, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, this maqam is very, very important. It requires two things. It requires simplicity in your life, meaning... You have to you have to eliminate many of the sins that we do on a daily basis. There has to, those have to be eliminated. They're very very minute and sort of 24 hours of consistent sins that we do, like looking at the wrong thing, eating the wrong thing, etc. And the other thing is that you have to establish a schedule. And until you have these two things, in fact, these two things don't result in the maqam mushahid. These two things result in all your maqam. In any progress where you need these two things. Number one is that you have to eliminate any of the any of the sort of things that are against the shariah that are wrong, that are errors. And two, you need to uh, establish a schedule of working towards closer to, um, towards a lot, which is a schedule of prayer, a schedule of, a schedule of learning, etc. So that was part of what I was going to do, because I was life and had a chance to experience more power in the Shaila. Well, I'll go down on the Alhamdulillah, wa kafa, wa salamu ala ibadah in the Dina Stora, and my vow. Fowl will be left in a shape on your dreams in the Rahman Ibrahim, when the Dina Dahad Rufina, then I'll be in the Hom Sulana. Well, 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 I'll be in the Hom Sulana. وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم The Prophet said in a very important hadith said أحب الأعمال إلى الله أدومها وإن قل that the most beloved of all deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones that are consistent even if they are few the, mo- the most beloved of deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those deeds that are consistently done, that are regularly done, that are done per, uh, with permanence, in qalla, and even if those deeds are few. This hadith highlights for anybody who wants to approach anything, especially their deen, and especially the spiritual aspect of their deen, the importance of regularity in whatever we aim to achieve. So if you have something that you need to do and you want to succeed in it, the secret to that is being regular in it. <coughs> now everybody knows this, you know, all of us have been students at one point or another during our lifetime. So everybody knows that for example, if I sit down and give a talk on study habits and how to succeed in, you know, doing well in college. And I started saying, well, the number one principle is that you study a little bit every day. That you spend some amount of time every single day studying at least an hour or two hours or three hours so that you have a regular habit. And every day you study, and that is the primary way in which you succeed in college. Nobody would have a problem with that. In fact, that is true. There's people who cram, and there's people who study regularly. And the people who cram, they make it past the test. They may even do well, but their knowledge never stays with them. And the people who study regularly and consistently make effort on a daily basis, you see them 20 or 30 years later, and they're the leaders in their field. It's always the people with the best habits. Even a person who has low ability, of someone who's not very intelligent, someone who may not have, you know, quote-unquote, the brains of another student, when they are apply themselves regularly, they succeed. And the person who can be very, very smart, they may be the smartest person in the class, and they may be able to cram and pass the test, but you'll always see them 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, they haven't really achieved what they could have because of their inability to be consistent in what they were doing. And this is true for anything. If you go to your banker or you go to someone and you say, I want to save X amount of money because I want to purchase a house by the time I'm 40, they'll tell you the exact same thing. Well, we need to come up with a plan in which you need to save $50 a week or you need to save $100 a week or you need to save X amount of money. And when you do that consistently and on a regular basis, then over time you'll begin to collect and amass a certain amount of wealth so that you can go and purchase whatever you're doing to purchase, be it a car or a house, etc. And, and you'll find this in every single aspect. If you want to exercise, if you go to the weight room today and just try to lift the whole weight room and you know leave the next day, it's not going to do you any benefit. But if you go on a daily basis and you train and you work at it and you put in a set amount of time, then over a, a week or two weeks or even a month, you'll begin to see improvements. The dean is the exact same way. I mean, developing your 
surroundings, developing your brain, developing your muscles, developing every other aspect of your life comes with consistency. So why wouldn't it apply to the heart as well, just on a rational basis? And then on top of that, you have this hadith, which obviously supersedes your ration, you, uh, all, anything that you're in your intellect, and that is that that the most beloved of deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are those that are permanent, even if they are few. So from this, we should really, really take a lesson that if we want to proceed and succeed in developing ourselves Islamically and spiritually, the only way to do it is with consistent action. Now that's very, very important for someone who is trying to develop their heart because there's no other way. You won't succeed. You can't just get excited one day and then do 20, 30 minutes of dhikr and then all of a sudden leave it and then two weeks later you hear a talk and you get excited and you say, today I'm going to sit down and do dhikr and then you leave it and then, you know, a month later you meet somebody and they start talking about dhikr and then you say, I'm going to do dhikr today and then leave it. You'll never get anywhere. You'll never get anywhere. It's like writing in water. Literally, it's writing in water. The only way to, to succeed in developing yourself is that you develop a regular schedule. And this has always been the practice of the people who have, of the Saudi of the people who aim to develop themselves, that they come up with a regular schedule. And that, well, that's the first principle. So you come up with a very regular schedule of how you're going to do things, and you stick to it, you defend it. Just like a warrior defends his ground, you defend your schedule against the Shabbat, because Shabbat's goal is that when you have a regular schedule, his goal will be to disrupt that schedule. That's his primary goal, because that's the way you succeed. He knows it. He knows that Allah loves those acts which are regular. So when you have regular acts, and you've established them in your life, then Shabbat's primary goal will be to remove them from your life. So not only do you need to establish certain acts in your life, but then you need to defend them, staunchly defend them against anything that might force you to change your schedule. So... That's the first thing. The second thing is that you have to realize that anytime you want to progress in the deen, you have to take each, you have to take it one step at a time. So you can't just read a whole book of hadith and say, I'm now going to come to the Masjid for Fajr, Lahore, Asim, Maghrib, and Nisha, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and all of a sudden you've established the whole deen in your life. You have to take everything step by step by step. So let's say that the first goal is, is that I don't have to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, I don't have class at 6 o'clock in the morning, I don't have any other responsibilities at 6 o'clock in the morning, so my goal will be that I'm going to come to the Masjid for Fajr every single day. Once you've made that goal, then you should begin to slowly aim towards achieving it, and that means coming regularly. So if you come one day, come the next day, come the next day, and make sure that's your primary goal, and that's your single goal for the week or for the month or however long it takes you to achieve it. And then once you establish it, then you should keep it with permanence. That's the way that you proceed and you progress in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You build on your deen, you build it, it's like a building. You're constantly adding, you're constantly expanding your horizons, you're constantly doing more to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the primary goal for us in our as well. I mean, everybody, if you have no set amount of dhikr that you do every day, then you're just wandering, randomly basically. You have to have a set amount of dhikr that you do every day, a prescribed amount, at least a minimum. A minimum that you say, no matter what happens today, I am going to do this with dhikr. Be it five minutes, be it three minutes, be it two minutes, whatever it is, it has to be regular. Similarly with reading the Quran, it should be at least an ayah. At least an ayah, just pick up the Quran and read at least one ayah, but make a regular schedule. Say to yourself, I have the ability to read one ayah. I have the ability to read two ayahs, but I'm going to do it every single day. That's the only way in which anyone can progress along this path, is that you have an established, regular set of deeds that you do. Now this is really important because when you're random, then you sometimes achieve things that you're able to do, but you're not able to keep up. And that is actually very dangerous. If you look in the Hadith, the Prophet has warned us from, and he himself was very, very adamant about not starting something, and then about starting something and then not being able to keep it up. And this actually comes into a very important concept about how judgment will be done on the, on the final day. So let's say that all of a sudden you come to the Masjid for Fajr for three days in a row, and you prove that you have the ability to do that. And then the fourth day you leave it, the fifth day you leave it, the sixth day you leave it, and you never come again. Well, on the day of judgment, those three times that you came are going to be a proof against you that you had the ability to come. That you were able to, that you had, you were physically able to, you were psychologically able to, you were able to get there, yet after that you didn't make the effort that you needed to in order to get there. And that effort can be anything. It could be telling to people that they need to call you in the morning, it could be setting 10 alarms, whatever it is, you need to have that minimal effort. That, that can be abused as a proof against you on the day of judgment. So any act that you establish, you should try to do it with permanence so that it doesn't turn against you on the final day. Meaning you do it and you add things to your, to your life that are going to regularly stay with you. To the extent that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he went for the Isra and Naraj, he saw one group of people whose mouths were being torn with hooks. And he asked the angel of Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is this group of people? And he was told that these were the people, people this, this was a group of people that memorized the Quran, but then forgot it. Now just imagine, there's a group of people that memorize portions of the Quran. One of the greatest things you can do, every haraf has ten rewards. Every single letter that you memorize, you get ten rewards. Yet they were being punished on the day of judgment for having forgotten the Quran that they memorized. And this is, a, this again, ties into the same theme. That once you establish something in your life, you had the ability to memorize that Quran. You showed the ability, you showed the energy, you showed the devotion to memorize it, yet you didn't keep up with it, you weren't consistent in it, you weren't regular in it, and therefore you made it a proof against you. And so this, you'll find the Surah al-Shayyah, you'll find the Surah al-Hadith, that the Prophet once he established an act in his life, he never left it. And where he thought that he could establish an act, and people might do it for a short period of time, but then might leave it, he stopped them. For example, when the Prophet was leading, the, was praying the, uh, the Tarawih prayer, and then the next day, a group of people joined him. And the next day, more people joined him. And the third day, even more people joined him. And what did the Prophet Sallallahu do? He stopped them. He stopped them from coming and praying behind him. Why? Because he said that, I am afraid that if you continue to do this, and you show that you have the ability to do this, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala will make a on you, and he sent everybody away. And it wasn't until after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that Allah then instituted the Tarawih prayer based on the fact that it could no longer become thought of because the Prophet Sallallahu was no longer in this world. But the point is, if you look at all these different riwayat, and there's countless, <coughs> countless riwayat about this subject, when you establish something in your life, you have to establish it in a way that you can regularly do it. This is not randomness. This is not, we don't get excited, we don't react, we act, we plan, we think. Similarly, if you want to succeed in anything, just as you have to plan and regularly do the deeds that are necessary to reach a goal, that's the exact same thing in this theme. 
And you'll never succeed. You, we will never succeed until we regularly establish one by one the different acts of the false isolation that are established within this life. I'm not saying you have to be very complicated. You have to be here and sit in the masjid for three hours every day and do, you know, 10,000 subhanAllah laws and 15,000 Allah Akbar. But I'm saying that whatever you do establish, the smallest of deeds that you decide that are going to be regularly part of your life, they should be established with permanence. So coming to the masjid for Fajr, coming to the masjid for Isha, a set amount of zikr, reading the Quran regularly, sending salawat and the Prophet them regularly, whatever you establish as your set amount, that should become permanent within your life. Just like brushing your teeth, just like eating three meals a day. You know, if somebody misses their lunch, they freak out and tell everybody, you know, I worked so hard today, I didn't have lunch, I still haven't had lunch, I have to have, go have lunch. Everybody understands, oh yeah, go have lunch, right? And it should be the exact same thing with our prayers. Without them, we should feel empty. Or at least, with the, especially with the Quran, reading the Quran regularly, without that, we should feel very, very empty. I mean, we have time to regularly read the paper. We have time to regularly read our favorite internet site. We have time to regularly watch the news. We should have time to regularly read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, the basic principle is, is that if you want to succeed and you're serious about this thing, the only way is through consistency. You have to have a set plan and you have to consistently approach that, those deeds and use them in order to attain your Islam subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us to be regularly, regular in whatever deeds we establish and to inshallah use those deeds to then progress towards him rather than having them used as a proof against us on the day of judgment. Alhamdulillah, wa kafa, wa salamu ala ibadihi al-nabi nasafa, amma ba'd. Fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytani wa jihim, bismillahi wa rahmanir rahim. Wal-ladhina jahadu fina, lanahliyannahum subununa. Subhan rabbi ka rabbil al-zaki amma yusikun, wa salamu ala al-mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Those who strive in our ways, we guide, those who strive in our way, we guide them on our paths. That's the ayah that I recited. And today I want to talk about something which is very, very important to us, not only in our progression, in our Islamic studies, but also in our daily lives, in everything that we do, and all of the undertakings that we pursue. And that is the concept of barakah. So there's two ways by which humans attain. One is through their effort, and the second is through barakah. Okay, so if you have a goal, or you have some idea, something that you want to achieve, there's two things that come into that. One is your effort, and two is barakah. These are the two key principles that lead to anything you do. Even if you're studying for a test, or you're going to college, or you're studying the deen, or you're memorizing the Quran, whatever you're doing, there's two aspects that are key. One is your effort, and two is barakah. Now your effort's obvious. And in this world, whoever makes effort, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set up the world, is that whoever makes effort, they get results. If you make an effort in something, you will get a result on a one-to-one -one ratio. So for example, if you look at the big textbooks, let me just give you my own personal examples from my field because that's what I know best. So in medicine, you look at textbooks of medicine and you'll see that somebody spent 30, 40, 50 years of their life devoting it to one field in medicine, just say the kidney. And within the kidney, they have so many subspecialties within the kidney itself, like this part type of disease in the kidney, that type of disease in the kidney, that type of disease in the kidney. So you have people who devote their lives to just one aspect of that, and then they write chapters in textbooks, they do research, they have laboratories where they investigate, and they have their patients, and they're specializing in that subject. And you see the results of their work. They may write, they may write five or ten chapters in various textbooks. And so that is a result of their direct effort. That's the first thing. And the same thing with anything that we do. Even the dean. If you put, a, if you put effort in something, you get a one-to-one -one result back. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but that's what you can expect. Now, with that effort, if you add something called barakah, then your individual effort gets multiplied several fold. So let me give you some examples. Do you understand the principle? The principle is that you need two things. You need effort and you need barakah in order to attain anything. If you put in effort, you get a result. There's no doubt about it. The whole reason why the world is, is dominating Muslims is not because they're blessed and Allah's blessing them. You know, there's a couple reasons, but it's not because they're blessed. It's because of their effort. They're putting effort into that thing. I mean, effort is so powerful that if you put effort into a piece of metal, you can make it fly. I mean, look at an airplane. If, if so you were told 500 years ago that this is metal, people will put effort into this metal, and they will construct something that can fly, and it will make tons and tons. It will be so heavy that you know, 50 men couldn't carry it. It will fly through the sky. People would laugh at you. But that's the result of effort. It's the result of thousands of people putting their minds together and continually making effort, and that's called science, and that's the whole, that's what the whole, that's what the whole branch of knowledge is, it's called science, and thousands of people have put their effort into it, more than thousands, by now probably millions. So wherever you put your effort, you get a result. That's obvious. Number two is, is that when a Muslim puts his effort into something, but connects it in with barakah, then he gets results which are greater than one-to-one. -one. It's not one person doing one thing, it's one person and he gets the results of a hundred people, or maybe ten people, or maybe a thousand people. Now take for example, all of them. Now the way you look for these examples is you look at, for example, the life of the Prophet Tyson, who was the most blessed person to ever test the face of this earth. He had the most barakah, if you want to say that. And in fact, his whole life was a mechanism of attracting the barakah of Allah. So what did he do? Within 23 years, he established such a movement, or he established such an environment within just Mecca and Medina, that it later went on to take over such a huge portion of the world that we sit here today, 1400 years later, and still say his name and say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and still dream of being at the time when he existed, etc., etc. So that was the blessing that Allah put. I mean, that has never happened in history, that one person starts an ideology, and within his lifetime, it conquers a huge portion of the land. It's never happened. I mean, communism, somebody found communism, and later on, communism, so other people, and other people, and other people, and all these people, whatever, and then they eventually established it in certain areas. But within 23 years, for an idea to grow and then establish itself like that, that's never happened in history. So the point is, is that the barakah of the Prophet Sallallahu is what allowed this to occur. And it's, a, it's the barakah of the Prophet Sallallahu the blessings that he had associated with his work, that allow us, 1500 years later or 1400 years later, to even sit in a gathering like this. I mean, imagine how many things last 1400 years, things come in and out of fashion. How many ideologies have lasted 1400 years? And to the pristine 
like with the degree of pristineness and clarity that exactly what the Prophet Sallallahu said, we try to do it to this day. We haven't altered it even one step. But at least there are groups of people in this world that still follow the footsteps of the Prophet exactly as he laid them down, and exactly as the Sahaba traversed upon them. That's exactly a sign of Barakah. Say for not take another example. Look at any of our ulama in the history of our deen. Any, anyone, any major alim in the history of our deen, and look at the books that they wrote. If you look at the greatest PhD, MD PhD, who's working at the greatest institution in the world, he may have written one chapter, he may have written two chapters, he may have written ten chapters. It's very unlikely that he wrote a whole textbook. And if the textbook is, if he did write a whole textbook, it will be with the help of a thousand other people, with the help of editors, with the help of computers, with the help of typists, with the help of a printer, etc. So he'll have written maybe a one thousand page textbook. Now you look at the ulama in our deen, in our history, and you see that not only did they write textbooks, but they wrote hundreds of textbooks, hundreds of books about their deen. And the books that they're writing, it's, one book is not one volume, but one book is not 20 pages, one book is eight volumes, nine volumes that they themselves wrote by hand with, at a time when there was no computer, no electricity, rarely did they have enough food to eat, they didn't have all these people where they could look up all this information on the internet and look up all this information in, in different libraries, everything was coming from their own head and from what their teachers taught them. Say for example, Mohan Ashraf Tanwi, and I give an example, I've given this example before as well, he wrote 1,500 and something books in his lifetime, right, 1,500 and something books in his lifetime that he himself wrote with his own hand. 5,000 books he was associated with in the sense that his students or he sat with the person and gave them the information, etc. So let's just take those 1,500 books. Now, of those 1,500 books, some of them are full capacity of the Quran. Some of them are translations of the Quran. Some of them are massive shuru of hadith, more than one volume. So if you look at all the work that he did, I mean, I was calculating this one day, he must have written a book a week. Right? We don't read a quarter of a book a week. He wrote a book a week. No, he's not, he's not writing things that people wrote before. You read his works, it's all new. It's all incredibly deep. So he's writing on, on, a, on a whole different level. And this is all about ulama. You look at what Hadith Ibn Hajar wrote, you just look at just his explication of Bukhari. Not all his other books. I mean, he did all the study of Hadith, he did all the study of Tasnir, he did so many other books. Just his book on the, on the Tashri of Imam Bukhari, and it's eight, nine volumes, and it's so dense and so thick and it's so complete that you have to just submit to it when you read it. And you couldn't even read it. If I said to you, your life goal is to read that book from cover to cover, you still won't complete that goal before you die. You still will not complete that goal. It's such a deep book. And that's just because we don't have the Barakah in our time that they used to have. So the secret to this deen in your approach to it, in your approach to your, 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 your daily life, etc., is Barakah. That is the real, real key thing that we aim to achieve. And the way you take this barakah in is by following the footsteps of the Sahaba who follow the footsteps of the Prophet Essentially, their lesson was a lesson of barakah. What do they teach you? How do you maximize the barakah in the food that you eat? And for those of you who are here in the Atikaf, we talked about this ahadith, right? Lo samma lakafakum. Lo samma lakafakum. There was a person who came, the Sahaba were sitting, six of them or five of them. There were enough food for two bites in front of all five of them. Big Sahaba, ready? I mean, these people were hungry, big hungry Sahaba. They didn't eat three meals a day. Right? And they were very, very well, they were, their bodies were very, very physically, they were strong. There were two bites sitting on one plate in front of all of them. All of them were sitting waiting to eat. An uh, Arabi, uh, one of the veterans came, and he took those two bites and ate them in two bites. He took the whole plate and ate in two bites. Which means two bites for the next one, no person was available. And the Prophet ﷺ after he ate that said, No samma lakafakum. If you would have taken the name of Allah, lakafakum. All of you would have been able to eat from it. And there's another hadith that we talked about in committee that particular uh, class. That the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with a group of Sahaba. And the Sahaba, one of the Sahaba is commenting on the food and he says, I had never seen in my life food with more baraka in it at the beginning of the meal and food with the least amount of baraka at the end of the meal. And they were sitting, and there was food in front of all of them. In the beginning, they had so much baraka, everybody was eating from it. All the whole gathering was eating from this small amount of food, and it wasn't disappearing. And after that, they stopped eating, they, they offered that at the end of the meal, all of a sudden, people were coming, and there was no food left. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ, what happened? The Prophet ﷺ said, in the beginning of the meal, all of you said, Bismillah. But then at the end of the meal, somebody came, and didn't say Bismillah, and began eating the food. So Shaitan, he ate with him. So Shaitan, he ate with him. So the whole lesson was in barakah. Now why is barakah important to us? When you have barakah in your life, then your money goes much further than even the billionaire. A person who has barakah in his life but makes a halal, healthy income, and does it, with, with a, does it submitting to, Allah, to the messenger and to the Prophet, and says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollar income has more barakah in it than the person who makes millions. You achieve more with that wealth than the person who makes millions. Because you, put, you connected it to Allah, it's a whole different game. The peace that you get in your heart from 50 thousand, 40 thousand dollars, but with halal and with barakah, will be much more than, the, than even a billionaire. Similarly, when you do your studies, when you work, when you're studying at school, if you uh, use, the, use means to establish barakah in your life, so you avoid sin, and, and you remember Allah, you keep your prayers intact, you fast in the month of Ramadan, you give away in charity, and you devote yourself the way you should be devoted, you model yourself after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you bring barakah into your studies. Then the person who sits and studies all day, you just have to study two hours, and your mind focuses, and you suck everything in, and you understand it at a whole different level. And otherwise, people can study for days, and they don't even know what they're reading. They still don't know what they're reading, they're ready for days, because there's a barakah factor involved there. Similarly, in your sleep, people sleep nine, ten hours a day, and they wake up and they're dead tired. And there's other people they sleep two hours a night and they're fresher than the most fresh person. Why? Because there's barakah in their sleep, because they know how to sleep. Knowing how to sleep itself is part of the deen. Then how did the Prophet Sallallahu sleep? What did he sleep on? Which way did he face? What did he say before he went to sleep? What did he say when he woke up? What do you think? Why did he do those things? Was he random? He was never random in anything that he did. Everything that he did was a title of Tibada. But when he slept, the way he slept, he did so because he was teaching, he was first of all attracting the barakah of Allah. And second of all, he was teaching the Ummah. That this is the way that you establish barakah in your life. This is the way that you establish barakah in your sleep. So his one hour of sleep at night and ten minutes of sleep in the afternoon was much more sufficient than our nine hours of sleep in the day. Why? Because he threw the barakah of Allah into his sleep. And so that one hour, it sufficed him. 
And all, all history shows thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands, generation after generation after generation, those people barely slept. Yet they lived in the dead of heat. They didn't have a car. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have water available to them from a pipe in their house. Everything that they did, they had to go and get it. They had to make massive effort. Yet, despite all of those difficulties and despite the tiredness that's associated with all of those difficulties, they still slept one or two hours. And on top of that, they knew how to sleep and they knew how to live their lives such that they would wake up with Hadid without an alarm clock. Allah would wake them up naturally because they knew the secrets of the establishment better than their lives. And we, with 50 alarm clocks, cannot even get up for Hadid. What a difference. One is a person sleeping after that much fatigue. So all day he's sitting in the heat. He doesn't have any seat. He has to go by horse where he wants to go. He's studying. He's studying in the dark under, you know, under a light, under the lantern. This is all about Baraka. That's the secret of the deed. And Baraka doesn't come through technology. People say, oh, you know, we have technology. Now. Technology doesn't do anything. That's not what Baraka is. That's the Baraka of the dunya. It's the dunya mechanism. It has nothing to do with the Baraka of Allah. Now, if you learn the mechanisms of connecting to Allah, and you put that Baraka in your life, and technology can help you, there's no doubt about it. But look at the Baraka of the Prophet and the Sahaba. That they established the deen, and not only the deen, but the true deen, and not only the true deen, but the depth of the deen, that those people then sacrificed their lives for it, with nothing, with no computers, no internet, no factories, no phones. No printing presses. No printing presses. And we, with computers, internet, practice, phones, printing presses, etc., are unable to even establish a thing within our own lives. Why? You should just sit down and reflect about the world and how it's changed. And you have all these means at your disposal, yet you're unable to do the things that you're supposed to do. It's because it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with those Yeah, those means are important. They do play a role, but the primary role is that you connect yourself to Allah and that you establish this product in your life. Now, when you do that, you will begin to do things in your life that you will never believe that you could have done. And I saw it with my own eyes because I've seen, I've seen kids that come to the Madrasa. I and mean, when I'm studying in the madrasa, they bring, his father brings this child to the madrasa. The guy is illiterate. The kid is completely illiterate. Right? He's failing school. His whole community calls him the devil's of the dumb in his community, in his village. And they put him in the madrasa. And within one year, the guy's reading, you know, Muftasar Quluri and Kafiya in complex classical Arabic. And then you see the same guy. He's a college student. Right? He's reading multiple languages. Not only does he know English, he knows German. And then he knows the language of mathematics. He knows the language of science. He knows the language of physics. You talk to him about electrons and he knows what you're talking about. You talk to him about algebra and he knows what you're talking about. You talk to him about proofs and geometry and he knows what you're talking about. He has air conditioning. He has all of the cities of the world and he tries to study Arabic and within five days he gives up. What's the difference between these two people? One guy is completely illiterate. You would never, you have to rank the people of the world and say, let's make a line. Who deserves to learn Arabic? Who has the ability to learn Arabic? That boy would come at the end of the line. And the person with the college degree and all the different, and all the different facilities available to him would come at the front of the line and yet Allah chooses from the back of the line and blesses that person with the ability to read his book and his messenger's words and their original language. It's all based on Barakah, and it's based on Niya. So we have to learn, we have to begin to understand, this is not a game anymore. And the way you achieve is by submitting to the methodology of the Prophet When you look like the Prophet, when you walk like the Prophet, when you eat like the Prophet, when you dress like the Prophet, you automatically attract the Barakah of Allah towards you. And I'm not making this up for my own self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself testifies in the book that the external appearance of the Prophet is important. What about, Ya ayyu al muhammad or Muddafir, or these ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, oh, oh, one wrapped up in a cloak. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is testifying or calling the Prophet by his external appearance. Not by Al Muhammad but by his external appearance. The Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet by his clothing, by something so superficial. Right? The world, people of the world today say, well, that's clothing is superficial. Clothing has nothing to do with anything. But why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the Prophet by his clothing? Oh, one wrapped up in a cloak. If his clothing was petty and superficial and had nothing to do with it, why is Allah showing in his book for 1400 years people will continue to read it until the end of time that I'm addressing my messenger by the clothing that he wore, by the shawl that he was wrapped up in, by the cloak that he was wrapped up in? Everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did was, is, is part of his connection to Allah. It was not random. The way he slept, the way he ate, the way he dressed, the way he used the bathroom, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he looked. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala himself says, we have seen your turning on your face towards the sky. Even that much, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala testifies to him in the Quran, that we see you turning your head to the sky. Even that action itself. And the Sahaba understood this. And the generations of ulama that came after them understood it. It's not a debated thing. There's no debate on the ulama. No ulama debate this. It's people that make up this own, their own thing in their own head that all oh, the Sunnah and the Prophet have nothing to do with the deen and then they apply themselves to the, to the technology of the world and use that as a means of achieving Barakah and nothing happens, nothing's been achieved. If you want to look at history and look at who's achieved anything, it's always the people who has revived the deen, it's always the people that are in the Quran, the Sunnah and the Sharia and the and the of the Prophet. Read Imam Ghazali's books. What does Imam Ghazali say? What's the history of Imam Ghazali? He says that I spent years searching for the true deen. Imam Ghazali's story is so important to, for us because what does he say? Imam Ghazali was someone who was the master of knowledge at his time. He was the head of his madrasa. Now, madrasa at that day and age is like college today. Imagine being the dean at Harvard. That's what Imam Ghazali was. Because at that time, everybody went to Madrasa. When a child was born, the parents said he's going to go to Madrasa. He's going to go to a Madrasa, he's going to become a Mufti. He's going to go to Madrasa, he's going to become a Mufassar. He's going to go to Madrasa, he's going to become a Muhammad. They competed in that. Like all, our, our children are born and then our parents say, he's going to become a doctor, he's going to become a lawyer. There was no concept of that. Everybody went to a Madrasa. So imagine Imam Ghazali at his time, that he is the head of the Madrasa, he's the head of the Harvard, of the, of the Madrasa. So think of him as the president of Harvard. And he writes in his book that I did not have true Islam. I was the head of the Madrasa. But I, had, I didn't have true Islam. People would come to me, go ask me for Islam, but I wasn't experiencing the deen. I knew there was something wrong. So what did he decide to do? He said, I found that there were four major subjects. And I decided to submit myself to them completely and see if there was truth and reality in them. 
So first he went to logic, then he went to philosophy, then he went to a third subject, and then he went to tasawwuf. That was the fourth subject. After he completed the three subjects, he said, I didn't find truth in either of these three subjects, so now I went to tasawwuf. But he writes Sufism, but it's just, he's saying, what means is tasawwuf? Yeah, I went to the people of Allah. He said, the problem was that if you want, but the problem with tasawwuf is you can't read it from a book. And here I am, the head of the greatest madrasa, one of the greatest madrasas. I'm the main person, the whole world comes to me for fatal and for information and for guidance. And I can't leave my position and go sit, with, sit in some cave and do liquor all day because I can't do that. I didn't feel like I could do that. So he says, for six months, every day I woke up. And for six months I said, Inshallah, today I'm going to go. I have to go. I'm, I'm fake. I'm, I'm not real. I haven't experienced it. Dean. I have to go. Every day he woke up for six months. And then he said, no, I have to stay here because I'm doing this to the people. What will, be, what will the people think? And I'm doing that to the people. So every single day he woke, he woke up like that. Then he says, after six months, one day I woke up and I lost my voice. And I said, this is a sign from Allah because now I can't lecture anymore and I can't lecture to the people anymore. So I took my stuff and I went to Syria, to Damascus. And I sat in the minaret of the, mus- of the masjid of Damascus and I went to the biggest person I could find, the biggest ahl al the biggest person at the the biggest sheikh I could find, and I began to train myself in the dhikr of Allah. And after that, he said, that's where I found reality. And it's written, you should read this book from guidance, uh, from error to guidance. It's a very famous book. It's very thin. It's 40 pages. It's a thin little book like this. But it's written in his own words. In the first person, he's describing his own life event. Then what happens? He began to understand the importance of zikr and the importance of following the sunnah. Now if you read the tahiyah, what does it talk about? It talks about eating on the ground, and it talks about how you're supposed to eat, and how you're supposed to walk, and how you're supposed to... It has all the sunnah of the Prophet it's loaded with the sunnah. Why? Because he found the secrets of the deen locked in the sunnah of the Prophet No person better understood how to get closer to Allah than the Prophet. And no person was destined to get closer to Allah than the Prophet So that, those sunnah are not random. They're not, they're, not, they're, not, they're not there just for us to read about. They're there for us to inculcate in our lives. And when we do so, you attract the barakah of Allah. And when you attract the barakah of Allah, your money becomes more valuable, your time becomes more valuable, your sleep becomes more valuable, your work becomes more valuable. Everything begins to act on a new level. And things that people do in, in, in a month, you do in a night. Literally, I'm telling you, when I was in the madrasa, and I was completely in that environment, I look back at the work that I did, and I see that in one night, I, do, I did there what I do in one month over there. And I look back, and I look at my notes, and I say, God, I haven't done this much in one month, and I can't believe that I did this. And when I look at some of the notebooks that I have, I mean, I'm just shocked at what happened over there. I'm just shocked, and that's all because I was in that environment. It's that environment that created such an environment that it just produces enormous amount of benefit. So this is the secret of life. This is the secret of success. So people complain about their sleep. People complain about their eating too much. People complain that there's not enough product in their time. People complain that their mouth isn't going far enough. People complain that they're not able to study Arabic. This is the answer. It's a single answer. And it's that you have to learn to attract the barakah of Allah by following the methods of the Prophet that has taught to us by the Sahaba and is carried on by every generation thereafter. And up to this day, there are these people that exist in the world. We've been blindsided by the 20th, the technology of the 21st century, but there are still people in the world that know these secrets. And I experienced it, and it's not, they're not few and far between their present. They are few and far between that they're present. But this is the secret. So if you want to know the secret, and most, anybody who asks me any questions, this is the answer. Because this is the thing that people complain about most. I'm eating and I don't get full. I'm eating too much and I'm still not full. I sleep eight hours a night and, I'm, and I not only do I sleep too much, but I don't get, I'm not, my sleep is not relieved. My prayers are empty. I pray, but I don't get anywhere. Yeah, because you don't have the vehicle. You're driving a broken down car with four flat tires, you're not going to get anywhere. Submit to the sunnah, and you'll be, you'll be in a new vehicle, the vehicle of the sunnah, and not only will your prayers take you to new levels, but your life will take you to new levels. The levels experienced by the Sahaba and those people that came after them. So anyway, this is the key thing. And this is our vicar. And people say, oh, well, that's the vicar of the, you know, of this group and that group. I'm telling you what our vicar is right now. Our vicar is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the secret of the vicar. Sitting down and doing vicar that has its own place. I'm not turning it down. But our vicar is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the secret. That's the continuous vicar. When you emulate the Prophet Sallallahu you are continuously in vicar. In fact, my sheikh taught me that rather than doing Mujahidah after Mujahidah after Mujahidah to achieve something in this thing. The truth of Mujahidah is submitting to the Sunnah. So sitting and not eating for 10 days, that's because Mujahidah and have its benefits, but to submit to the Sunnah is the truth of the Mujahidah. Because that is the mechanism that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to attain closest to Allah. That's the secret of the Sunnah. And when you begin to emulate the Prophet's 24 hour life, then your life will change. And not only will your life change, but you'll change the people around you, and you'll change the people in your community, and in the world will meet a force that they've never met before. That's the secret of the Sunnah. So anyway, that's what I want to put in this concept of barakah. Keep this in mind because it applies to everything that you do. This concept of barakah is very, very essential to our progress. Wa akhwat da'wana alhamdulillah wa alhamdulillah.